Welcome to Poems You Need, where two poets who believe in the transformative power of language share the poems they need in hopes of helping you find the poems you need, too. Hi, I'm Kelly Russell Agadon. And I'm Melissa Stutter. And today we're reading poems by Oliver de la Paz. And I'm going to start out with Oliver's new book, The Diaspora Sonnets. And this is a beautiful award-winning book that um, explores um, Oliver's journey and immigration from the Philippines to um, America. And there's a lot of traveling in here. And towards the end of the book, there's a lot of traveling in cars. And I really love the metaphor of that and um, the repetition in here, because for me, that's so much of being in a car. Um, but what Oliver does really well is um, brings in um, his father into this poem. And so I felt like this poem worked um, in in history and our lives as art, um, but also in present day. And, and I felt um, there was just a lot of different ways that you could read this poem. And I'm, I always love poems that you can read in, in different ways. And it was very hard to choose a poem out of this book to read because they were all um, just so beautifully written. Uh, and this one is called Diaspora Sonnet. Imagining my father on the interstate with dividing lines blurring beneath. Outside, the hills are yielding mysteries to snow. The past creates itself into smaller and smaller blankets. How to live your current life. Meadows open into meadows. I've questioned the days when I can't fix things, when the horizon edge never fits any seams. I've questioned the weeks I've seen father wander from home to home inside the space of a room. How to live your current life. Roadmaps and gasps packing just enough to change from one dry shirt to another, to have enough change for a shower and a side road shelter, and time to fill the dashes on asphalt with the cursive roads, neat as yellow paint. Hmm. Beautiful reading and gorgeous poem. Um, I love the way the words just transform from one meaning to another, changing the shirt and change of coins, and you just feel them spinning around like coins through the poem. Um, beautiful. And that question, how to live your current life, I mean, that's the question. <laughs> you know, that's it, right? <laughs> Life is a journey and we're moving forward and, and, and we're asking. And there's a moment where the speaker in the poem says, I've questioned the days when I can't fix things. And it was just, it's to me that I felt so much for the speaker there where we're trying our best and we're caring for people or we're, we're trying to, to move forward. And so, yeah, I really felt like this poem was just such a journey in so many different ways. Absolutely. And that, that line too about um, home to home inside the space of a room and all the different things that that can mean, both literally and metaphorically. And just, I've been turning that over in my mind, thinking about all the possibilities there, you know, from the diaspora to um, the, the places inside the mind. Um, with the mind as a room. Um, and I think I was thinking about that largely because of the poem that I chose, which is from a different book called The Boy in the Labyrinth. And um, it's about his son who has autism. And um, it's, you know, it's such a view inside of a, a neurodivergent mind. And um, the whole book is really interesting. Like you said, it was so hard to choose a poem to read because I could have just read any poem in this book and been so thrilled about it. Um, it's 
situated or it's organized in different kinds of poems. So there are like the poems that are from the boy's perspective that are the labyrinth poems. And then there are these poems that are autism screening questionnaires. And there are several of those. And those happen to be my favorites. And those are what I'll read from. And um, I was kind of, Kelly, I know you love this movie, Contact, which I also love and my daughter loves. And I was thinking about that line about they should have sent the poet, you know, when I was reading this book. Yeah, when these kinds of questionnaires have to be filled out, they should send a poet, you know, to answer with metaphors and beautiful words and understanding and um, empathy, you know. So um, anyway, for those of you who are watching, I've asked Kelly to read this poem with me because I thought it would be nice to have one person asking questions and another doing the answers. So um, I'll read the title and we'll just jump in. Autism Screening Questionnaire, Social Interaction Difficulties. One, does your child have poor eye contact? Does he stare from unusual angles? Yes, like a dark bird from a high perch. Yes, with acetylene torches lit somewhere in the distance, with eyes wide as morphos iridescence. Yes, wild and hot like fixed stars. Two, does your child not seem to listen when spoken to directly? We call it dappled thoughts. He is constantly dappled here and not here. He is a thrush hidden in the sage. Three, does your child have excessive fear of noises? Does he cover his ears frequently? With wind? There are moments, agonies, like the time we found him covering his ears in a cement sewer pipe during a storm, or when he fled into the street, shocked by the vacuum. Often, we hold him hard to keep the world from flooding in. Often, the world is sirens. Four, does your child seem like he is in his own world? We mourn him daily. And yet he guides me by the hand through the threshold of his room as one guiding someone just off a train, gently and lightly, avoiding the gap between the platform and the track. The heat from his hand, combustion worn, old stove in which we've heated this house. Five, does he lack curiosity about his environment? Because the color of the red door renders it mute. Because the color of the die-cast car is an empty blue. And the sound of our voices could be any possible starling. We are not here. He is not here. And what of the place you reside if you don't reside in it? Where then does your body blink? Six. Do his facial expressions not fit situations? Nulled into a thick disquiet, mouth agape, agate to the eye, touches quick the inseam, and no blemish, no, no turning away and no smile. The contraption shuts its winking gap. Seven. Does he cry inappropriately? Does he laugh inappropriately? The soothing so honed it does not surface or salvage the daily losses, which are also sharp vibratos of hums along the jawbone, the music's arrowing shot into the thalamus, a strobe's command and call, a conspiratorial ache. Eight. Does he have temper tantrums? Does he overreact when he doesn't get his way? He is a dark and stabled bull, kicking at the chained gate. Nine, does he ignore pain? For example, when he bumps his head, does he react? 
If it strikes, you can't rescind it. Juncture to the brain, sharp cortical heart into which leap charges, synapse to synapse. But then a what? The question asks its question. A hurt insists. And yet. 10. Does he dislike touch? Doesn't want to be held. There's something about proximity, the dutiful belonging of atoms, and how we relate to the world through our skin, the exposed parts of ourselves, and how those pavilions are brushed by a plum tree's wicked thorns. 11. Does he hate crowds? Does he have difficulties in restaurants and supermarkets? Every day he's praying through the meanwhiles, the sequences of not just a flutter, but alone he sits on the periphery, ears beside his little body. Twelve, is he inappropriately anxious, scared? To soothe the sound of humming through tea, and so a symphony of fears, the ventricular outbursts Pleat the clouds, the sky is always exploding, and in that delirium, a curdled tone. 13. Does he speak the same to kids, adults, or objects? Remind us of our asymmetries. Who is that again? And what smile to let the darkness in? I see him speak to the man in blue work clothes and the way his face yields to the light, to the way moments like this explode. 14. Does he use language inappropriately, wrong words or phrases? The world is a network of minds. Think of the tongue and the fibers that make its muscles. The branching capillary network enmeshed, alive and cooled with song that slides away. Tongue jammed in its stirrup, thinking of itself and the blood-red amanitas pushed out of earth. Mm. Wow, beautiful job reading that. That was a long poem and you did a great job. You too. I was thrilled when um, you chose that poem because not only is, you know, it's a favorite mine poem of Oliver's that he's written, but just a favorite poem of mine out of all the poems in the world. It is one that when I first read it, it made me understand how as a poet, when we're writing about these um, harder topics, sometimes finding that container that allows you to put... um, these deeper thoughts into it. And I felt that's what Oliver did so brilliantly here is that he created this container and this form. And since then, I know that Susan Rich has a poem about a tougher topic using this form, but I thought what it's like a back door that um, allows you to go deep into a subject um, in, in just this really engaging way. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm, not autistic, but I am neurodivergent, which is one of the reasons I love this poem so much. I felt understood in so many ways in this poem, and it was like a relief to read it and to feel understood in that way. But I would say in terms of the neurodivergent mind, it it, it is really hard to come at something directly sometimes, you know, having a side door, having a container, uh, something to keep things from just spinning out of control, you know, is actually a really wonderful thing. So in addition to um, being a good fit for the reasons that you mentioned, I think also in terms of what the poem is about, um, it's such a good fit to just have a container. Um, and it's also a wonderful way of taking something that's typically sterile And, you know, I think, Kelly, when you and I talked about this poem another time, you talked about the the idea of taking something that's medical and dry and answering it with beauty. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's the power of poetry to transform. 
Yeah. And, and that's really what it does. That, you know, Oliver took these questions that are not beautiful and, and, and kind of negative of like, is he inappropriately anxious? There's so much judgment there that, you know, it's, um, and then to respond with that beauty, to respond with the poem, I thought it was just this, um, it, it, you saw the two different sides of, of the poem, the very sterile side of the medical community that's trying to help and figure things out. But then also just the gorgeousness and the beautifulness of this human who has this incredible mind. And, and I thought Oliver did that really well. Don't you wish you could just frame these and put them around in doctor's offices and hospitals and elevators and hospitals and just let people read this and think about themselves and their bodies and their minds in a way that is um, so much more empathetic than right yeah it makes me want to respond to anytime somebody gives me a survey to fill out i want to give all the the right poetic answers so Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a beautiful poem, and uh, I'm so glad you chose it. Thank you for celebrating poetry with us today. Information about the poet and works featured can be found on the episode page. And if you enjoyed today's reading, please press the like button and subscribe so not to miss another poem. You can also share the episode with a friend and we hope you do. Until next time, we wish you beauty, inspiration, and very meaningful days. May you always have the poems you need.